Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekados Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study of humility by Andrew Murray, which is titled The Journey Toward Holiness. Today we are in chapter 4, which itself is entitled, Humility in the Teaching of Jesus. Teresa of Avila once said, Humility must always be doing its work like a bee making its honey in the hive. Without humility, all will be lost. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus says, Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. In chapter 20 of Matthew, verses 27 and 28, Jesus says, Whosoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. We see humility in the life of Christ demonstrated in how he laid open his heart to us. Through his teaching, we hear him speak of it, how he expects his disciples to be humble as he was. Let us carefully study the passages to see how often and how earnestly he taught it. It may help us to realize what he asks of us. Point one, look at the commencement of his ministry. In the Sermon on the Mount, he opens with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The very first words of his proclamation of the kingdom of heaven reveal the open gate through which we may enter. The kingdom comes to the poor, who have nothing in themselves. The earth is for the meek, who seek nothing for themselves. The blessings of heaven and earth are for the lowly. Humility is the secret of blessing for the heavenly and the earthly life. Point two. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus offers himself as teacher. He tells us both what the Spirit is and what we can learn and receive from him. Meekness and lowliness are the qualities he offers us. In them, we will find perfect rest. Humility is our salvation. Point three. The disciples had been disputing among themselves who would be the greatest in the kingdom and had agreed to ask the master. He placed a child in their midst and said, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The question is far reaching. What will be the chief distinction in the heavenly kingdom? The glory of heaven, the mind of heaven, is humility. Jesus said it best in Luke chapter 9 verse 48 when he said, he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Point four, the sons of Zebedee asked Jesus if they could sit on his right and on his left. These are the highest places in the kingdom. Jesus said it was not his to give, but the father's who would give it to those for whom it was prepared. They must not seek it or ask for it. Their thoughts must be of the cup and the baptism of humiliation. And then he added, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Humility, as it is the mark of Christ, will be the one standard of glory in heaven, the lowliest is the nearest to God. Point five, speaking to the multitude and the disciples of the Pharisees and their love of the chief seats, Christ once again said, the greatest among you will be your servant. Humiliation is the only ladder to honor in God's kingdom. Point six, on another occasion in the house of a Pharisee, he spoke the parable of the guest who would be invited to come up higher. And he added, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, 
and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You can read of this in Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. The demand is inexorable. There is no other way. Self-abasement alone will be exalted. Point seven. After the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, Christ spoke again. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke eighteen fourteen. In the temple and presence and worship of God, everything is worthless that is not pervaded by deep, true humility toward God and humankind. Point eight. After washing the disciples' feet, Jesus said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. John thirteen fourteen. The authority of command and example, every thought, either of obedience or conformity, makes humility the first and most essential element of discipleship. Point nine. At the Lord's Supper table, the disciples still disputed who should be greatest. Jesus said, The greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. I am among you as one who serves. Luke 22, 26 and 27. The path Jesus walked, which he opened up for us, the power through which he wrought our salvation and by which he saves us, is the humility that makes us the servant of all. How little this is preached. How seldom it is practiced. How faintly the lack of it is felt or confessed. I cannot say how few attain to some recognizable measure of likeness to Jesus in his humility, but fewer ever think of making it a distinct object of continual desire or prayer. How little the world has seen it. How scarcely it is seen in the inner circle of the church. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Oh, that God would convince us that Jesus means this. We all know what the character of a faithful servant or slave implies. Devotion to the master's interests. Thoughtful study and care to please him. Delight in his prosperity and honor and happiness. There are servants on earth in whom these dispositions have been seen, and to whom the name of servant has never been anything but glory. To how many of us has it been a new joy in the Christian life to know that we may yield ourselves as servants, as slaves to God, and to find that his service is our highest liberty, the freedom from sin and self. We need to learn another lesson, that Jesus calls us to be servants of one another, and that as we accept it heartily, this service will be a most blessed one, a new and fuller deliverance from sin and self. At first, it may appear hard. This is because of the pride that still counts itself something. If once we learn that to be nothing before God is the glory of the creature, the spirit of Jesus, the joy of heaven, we shall welcome with our whole heart the discipline we may have in serving even those who try or annoy us. When our own heart is set upon this true sanctification, we will study each word of Jesus on self-abasement with new zeal and no place will be too low, no stooping too far, and no service too mean or too long, if we may but share and prove the fellowship with him who said, I am among you as one who serves. Here is the path to the higher life. It is the lowest path. This was what Jesus said to the disciples who were thinking of being great in the kingdom and of sitting on his right hand and on his left. Ask not for exaltation. That is God's work. See that you humble yourselves and take no place before God or man but that of a servant. That is your work. Let that be your one purpose and prayer. God is faithful. 
Just as water seeks and fills the lowest place, so the moment God finds the creature empty, his glory and power flow in to exalt and to bless. He that humbles himself, and this must be our only aim, shall be exalted. That is God's aim. By his mighty power and in his great love, he will do it. People sometimes speak of humility and meekness as something that would rob us of what is noble and bold. Oh, that all would realize that this is the nobility of the kingdom of heaven, that this is the royal spirit that the king of heaven displayed, and that this is godlike to humble oneself and to become the servant of all. This is the path to the gladness and the glory of Christ's presence in us, of his power resting upon us. Jesus, the meek and lowly one, calls us to learn of him the path to God. Let us study the words we have been reading until our heart is filled with the thought, my one need is humility. And let us believe that what he shows, he gives. And what he is, he imparts. As the meek and lowly one, he will come in and dwell within the longing heart. Chapter 5, Humility in the Disciples of Jesus. Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, once said, God created the world out of nothing, and as long as we are nothing, he can make something out of us. Luke chapter 22 verse 26 reads, The greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. We have studied humility in the person and teaching of Jesus. Now we will look for it in the circle of his chosen companions, the twelve apostles. If we see a lack of humility in the disciples, and a contrast between Christ and men is brought out more clearly, it will help us to appreciate the mighty change that Pentecost brought and prove how real our participation can be in the triumph of Christ's humility over the pride Satan breathed into humankind. In the text quoted from the teaching of Jesus, we have seen the occasions on which the disciples proved how much they lacked the grace of humility. Once they were disputing about who should be the greatest. Another time, the sons of Zebedee, with their mother, had asked for the first places, the seats on the right hand and on the left of Jesus in glory. And later on at the Last Supper, there was a contention again about who should be counted the greatest. This is not to say that there were not moments when they did humble themselves before the Lord. Peter cried out, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. On another occasion, the disciples fell down and worshiped him when he stilled the storm. But such infrequent expressions of humility only emphasize the general habit of their minds as shown in the natural and spontaneous revelations of the place and power of self. The study of the meaning of their behavior will teach us some important lessons. First is the fact that there may be the enthusiastic and active practice of Christianity while humility is still sadly lacking. Let me repeat that. There is the fact that there may be the enthusiastic and active practice of Christianity, and yet humility is still sadly lacking. The disciples had a fervent attachment to Jesus. They had forsaken all to follow him. The Father had revealed to them that he was the Christ of God. They believed in him, they loved him, and they obeyed his commandments. When others fell away, they remained faithful to him. They were ready to die with him. But deeper than all of this devotion was the existence of an inner power of sin and selfishness. This power had to be dealt with before they could be witnesses of the power of Jesus to save. It is so with all of us, friends. We may find professors and ministers, evangelists and Christian workers, missionaries and teachers, 
in whom the gifts of the Spirit are many and manifest, and who are the channels of blessings to multitudes, but of whom, when tested or close interpersonal relationships reveal their true characters, it is only too evident that the grace of humility as an abiding characteristic is rarely to be seen. All of this tends to confirm the reality that humility is one of the chief and highest virtues, one of the most difficult to attain, and one to which our first and greatest efforts ought to be directed. Humility is a virtue that only comes in power when the fullness of the Spirit makes us partakers of the indwelling Christ, and He alone lives within us. Second is the reality that external teaching and personal effort are powerless to conquer pride or create the meek and lowly heart in a person. Again, the reality that external teaching and personal effort are powerless to conquer pride or create the meek and lowly heart in a person. For three years, the disciples had been in the training school of Jesus. He had told them what the main lesson was that he wished to teach them. Learn from me, he said, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Time after time, he had spoken to them, to the Pharisees, and to the multitudes of humility as the only path to the glory of God. He had not only lived before them as the Lamb of God in his divine humility, but he had also more than once unfolded to them the inmost secret of his life. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And I am among you as one who serves. He had washed their feet and told them to follow his example. But all was to little avail. At the Last Supper, there was still contention as to who should be the greatest. They had doubtless tried to learn his lessons and firmly resolved not to grieve him again. But all was in vain. To teach them and us the lesson that no outward instruction, not even of Jesus himself, no argument, however convincing, no sense of the beauty of humility, however deep, no personal resolve or effort, however sincere and earnest, can cast out pride. When Satan casts out Satan, it is only that he might enter afresh in a mightier, subtler power. Nothing works but this, that the new nature in its divine humility be revealed in power to take the place of the old, to become our true nature. The final point is the revelation that it is only by the indwelling of Jesus in his divine humility that we can become truly humble. We have our pride from Adam. We must have our humility from Jesus. Pride rules in us with incredible power. It is ourselves, our very nature. Humility must become ours in the same way. It must be our true selves our very nature. As natural and easy as it has been to be proud, it must become natural and easy for us to be humble. Again, as natural and easy as it has been to be proud, it must become natural for us to be humble. The promise is, where sin abounded, grace did abound more exceedingly. All Christ's teachings of his disciples and all their vain efforts were the needful preparation for his entering into them in divine power, to give and be in them what he had taught them to desire. In his death, he destroyed the power of the devil. He put away sin and produced an everlasting redemption. In his resurrection, he received from the Father an entirely new life, the life of man in the power of God capable of being communicated to men and entering and renewing and filling their lives with his divine power. In his ascension, he received the spirit of the Father, through whom he might do what he could not do while upon earth, and that is to make himself one with those he loved, 
to actually live their life for them so that they could live before the Father in a humility like unto his own. On Pentecost, he came and took possession of the church. The work of preparation and conviction, the awakening of desire and hope that his teaching brought about, was perfected by the mighty change of Pentecost. The lives and the epistles of James and Peter and John bear witness that all was changed and that the spirit of the meek and suffering Jesus had taken full possession of them. There may be some readers who have never given particular thought to the subject, and therefore they do not realize its immense importance as a question for the church. There are others who have felt condemned for their lack of humility, and they have made great efforts only to fail and to be discouraged. Still others may be able to give joyful testimony of spiritual blessing and power, yet there has never been conviction concerning the lack in those around them. Some may be able to witness to the Lord's deliverance and victory in this area, but realize how much they still need and may expect from the fullness of Jesus. To whatever class you belong, may I urge the pressing need to seek a deeper conviction of the unique place that humility holds in the life of every believer. Let us consider how far the disciples were advanced while this great grace was still lacking. And let us pray that other gifts may not so satisfy us that we never grasp the fact that the absence of humility is no doubt the reason why the power of God cannot do its mighty work. It is only where we, like the Son, Jesus, truly know and show that we can do nothing of ourselves, that God alone will do everything. It is when the truth of the indwelling Christ takes the place it deserves in the experience of believers that the church will put on her beautiful garment and humility will be seen in her teachers and members as the beauty of holiness. Well, we're going to close there today, friends. And if you're like me, you are being shown something new and fresh receiving clarity on a quality that is often overlooked in the life of the believer. And rather than try to attempt to add something to what Arnold Murray has already told us or is going to tell us in future chapters, let me simply encourage you to stay with this study, for we have yet to talk about humility in daily life, humility and holiness, humility and sin, humility and faith, humility and death to self, humility and happiness, humility and exaltation, which all lie within the chapters that we'll be discussing in our times together in the days ahead. Please, friends, don't take these words lightly. Go back and listen to this again and make humility, this great quality that we see in our Lord Jesus, make it the center of all your prayers. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.